and in the palace and kept on hunting. So there you go, listeners. You can hunt or fish or do some sort of outdoor activity. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. The fifth thing to do during a quarantine, I think this is very useful if you happen to be a creative. Maybe you have been planning on writing a book or painting something, coding software, doing any sort of project where you have to hunker down for a long time. If that's what you need to do, then quarantines are great. And you can follow the example of William Shakespeare because he probably wrote some of his best plays during a pandemic. There's an article that appeared in The Atlantic a couple weeks ago, and the title is Shakespeare Wrote His Best Works During a Plague, and this is my source for this year. This was something that playwrights had to deal with constantly. The theaters of the Elizabethan era in the 1500s were frequently shut down due to bubonic plague, which killed about a third of the city's population. The rule of London was that once the death rate exceeded 30 per week, then performances would be canceled because you'd have a lot of people packed together and you don't want that during a plague. Shakespeare himself barely survived an outbreak that killed his older siblings when he was an infant. London officials in the 16th century thought that people would flock to see these plays and they'd be close pestered together in small rooms as they wrote, and this would cause plague and increase the rate of affections. In the first decade of the reign of King James I, the plague meant that London theaters were probably closed more often than they were open, and Shakespeare's troupe, the King's Men, had to rely on royal gifts and tours of the provinces in England in order to replace their lost box office. So that's one advantage they had then in London or in England. There was no national quarantine that would be impossible to enforce, but there was also much lower population density, so it was much easier to go into the countryside. The scholar uh, James Shapiro writes in his book, The Year of Lear, that the early epidemiologists of the period weren't the only ones who blamed the spread of disease on people breathing the same foul air in enclosed encampments. Religious zealots also blamed the theater for the plague because of what they thought of the immorality and the blasphemy and the lewdness and the cross-dressing where men dress up as women. One preacher during the Elizabethan period said that The cause of plagues is sin, and the cause of sin are plays, and the cause of plagues are plays. What's interesting is that the plagues may have caused plays. So he got the cart before the horse there. Shakespeare, a lot of people think, turned to poetry when plagues closed the theaters in 1593. That's when he published his narrative poem, Venus and Adonis, in which the goddess begs a kiss from the beautiful boy to drive infection from the dangerous year. For she claims, the plague is banished by thy breath. So he's taking real life inspiration there. Low poetry could have also been spurred on by the plague. And some thought could even cure it. But Shapiro thinks that another closure of theaters in 1606 allowed Shakespeare, who was an actor and a shareholder in The King's Men, to get a lot of his writing done. He was able to meet the demand for new plays in a busy holiday season at court. So during this period, he turned out King Lear, Macbeth, and Anthony and Cleopatra. So that's a pretty good haul for what quarantine brought him. So the plague decimated young populations, but unfortunately, in a positive turn of events for Shakespeare, it also wiped out the competition. There were companies of boy actors who dominated the early 17th century stage and could often get away with more dicey productions than their older competitors. And Shakespeare's company took over the indoor Blackfriars Theater in 1608 after the leading company of younger boys collapsed. So they started doing edgier, darker productions and capitalized on a market share that was now available. So the plagues also provided a lot of metaphors in his plays as well. There are references to the plague and its sores called God's Tokens in Anthony and Cleopatra. Also, a Roman soldier fears that his side will fare like the token pestilence where death is sure. This also leads to the conclusion of Romeo and Juliet with plagues. The friar who's supposed to tell Romeo that Juliet is only pretending to be dead is prevented from delivering his message because he's quarantined with a fellow priest who's been helping the sick. This line goes, The searchers of the town, suspecting that we both were in a house where the infectious pestilence did reign, sealed up the doors and would not let us forth. So Romeo never gets the message and he kills himself before Juliet revives. Okay, so that's what you can do if you are bunkered down. You can write a play. And the last thing you can do is that you can discover physics. 
Although I should mention that you're probably only going to discover physics if you happen to be Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, I mean, if you take any kind of science-based curriculum in college, he practically dominates your first two years. Calculus, that's Isaac Newton. A lot of physics, classical physics and calculus-based physics, that's Isaac Newton. He invented classical physics with his tract, Philosophe Naturalis Principa Mathematica. And the building blocks of this came from when he was doing research while he was at home from Cambridge University when it was forced to shut down during a plague and he was also under quarantine. He wrote formulas of the mathematical constant of gravity while he was observing an apple falling from the tree. This is what sprang from the him observing the apple that fell from the tree, his laws of planetary motion, and movements of the observable universe. So, I mean, Newton was incredibly prolific. He had discoveries that people wouldn't really taught for about 300 years. Other than Einstein, it's harder to find a physicist that accomplished more than he did. Now, he was an isolated person by nature, so he could probably take more advantage of a quarantine than someone who's more extroverted and clawing at the walls and just desperate to get out could have. A little bit on his background and why he was able to do this. He's born on 1642 on Christmas Day in a village in Lincolnshire, England. His father died two months before he was born, and he studied a basic education at a local school. Then he sent to a grammar school at age 12. He then lived in the home of a pharmacist who had a collection for which Newton pilfered to perform experiments. At the age of 19, he enters Trinity College in Cambridge and learns of the scientific revolution that's longed by Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo. He studies philosophy and theology and returns home after his 1665 graduation in order to escape the plague. He's an interesting guy. There's a manuscript collection of Newtons that's available online digitally, and he's interested in a lot of things when he's young. His notebook, which began in 1659, it's filled with formulas and recipes and instructions for performing simple conjuring tricks. In uh, one passage, he talks about how to turn water into wine by taking as much Lockwood as you can hold in your mouth without discovery, tie it up in a cloth and put it in your mouth and then drink some water and chomp on the Lockwood three or four times and then spit it out in the glass. So no one knows how to take advantage of solitude like he does. He was sort of a polymath, and this made him bored with Cambridge's strict curriculum, and he disregarded subjects in his first year. His instructors thought that he was a poor student. But it wasn't until his mathematics professor recognized his genius that his scholarly career begins. He begins with a series of notes on Aristotle, and then he gets into Descartes' latest theories on science and mathematics. Anyway, here's how he takes advantage of the plague. It breaks out in 1665 in London. Cambridge is closed for 18 months. And Newton then returns to his family estate in Lincolnshire. This is an incredibly productive period for him, even though he's only in his mid-20s. He generalized the results of the binomial theorem in mathematics. He establishes the foundation of calculus. He develops his ideas of light and color and its effects on optics. He observes a falling apple, which plants a seed in his mind of a theory of universal gravity. When he returns to Cambridge, he publishes his book on optics and he theorizes that light is made of particles and white light composed of many colors, which challenges the notion of the day that light consists of waves. In 1687, this is jumping ahead several decades, but just to give you an idea of his most notable accomplishments, he then publishes his work on the movement of planetary bodies and planetary motion. This is his theory of motion, and he uses calculus to derive Kepler's law of planetary motion from an inverse square force law of gravity. So for the next 250 years, his theory of planetary motion is the guiding light of astronomy. It's not really overtaken until quantum mechanics offer explanations of objects traveling very fast in relation to each other. But there's still all sorts of things that happen where people are using Newtonian physics to calculate what's going to go on. I think part of the reason why Newton was able to take advantage of his quarantine is that He was a really good note taker, and he was really good at observing his day-to-day life and extracting meaning from it. The digital archives of his writings give us all sorts of notebooks that he had and kept, and we get a clue into what's going on through his mind. He produced about 100 pages of notes a day. There's about 4.2 million published and unpublished words by Newton, and they're a collection of writings on physics and math and theology. But he was also into alchemy. He also loved to study the book of Revelation and look at the temple of 
Jerusalem in the Old Testament and calculate its measurements and wondering if he could get some cultic knowledge out of it. And he even calculated Doomsday, which is 2060. So I guess we'll find out if Newton was right or not. He was uh, into all sorts of things. But interesting thing about him is that he kept a close log of the mistakes that he made throughout the day. Benjamin Franklin did something similar where he would keep track of whether he was failing in his virtues. So they both believed in the idea of note-taking to self-improvement. And these are funny. Something that Newton did is that he wrote down all the mistakes and confessions he made in one day. This is in uh, before Whit Sunday on 662, and I'll just go through a few of the highlights because there's dozens and dozens here. Some of the mistakes Newton made, he used the word God openly. He ate an apple in church. He made a feather on Sabbath. He denied that he made a feather on Sabbath. He made a mousetrap on Sabbath. He played the chimes on the Sabbath. So you're really not supposed to do much on the Sabbath this period. He squirted water on the Sabbath. He made pies on the Sabbath. He carelessly heard and committed many sermons. Not really sure what that means there. He refused to go to the close at my mother's command. He hit many. He had unclean thoughts. He stole cherry cobs from Edward's store. He denied that he did so. He punched his sister. He robbed his mother's box of plums and sugar. He called Dorothy Rouse a jade. Ooh. He was gluttonous. He was peevish. He had to fall out with his servants. So anyway, as you can see, he's, I think, able to extract a lot in a situation like a quarantine and isolation, because he's simply very observant of things going on around him. Most people wouldn't think much of about an apple falling from a tree. But Newton noticed everything. He saw everything. He was meticulous about his personal habits, and when he saw an apple, he saw the theory of universal gravity. So just being aware of your environments is something else, too. Now, Newton wasn't perfect, of course, Part of the reason he could manage such feats of productivity and isolation and quarantine was because he was so reclusive by nature. He was very introverted. He was very protective of his privacy. And he was insecure throughout his life due to his difficult childhood and early death of his father. He was depressive. He could be violent. And he distrusted those around him. He also worked to destroy the reputation of Gottfried Leibniz, who independently discovered calculus. He thought that Leibniz stole it from him. And some of this paranoia was justified, but his prickly temperament only intensified his paranoia. Okay, listeners, so that was number six right there. These were six things that you can do during a quarantine. So I hope this was useful for you. At the very least, you can enjoy some food, spend some time with family. If your friends aren't sick, maybe a few of them. If you're not squirting any quarantine rules, maybe tell some stories like the Decameron. Go hunting, go fishing, help out the sick like a plague doctor. Work on your personal pet project, work on that book, work on that poetry, work on that computer program, whatever it happens to be. Don't freak out, please. I don't want you to go down history as someone like a flagellant. All right, listeners. Well, that is all that I have for today's episode. Once again, I want to start things off by thanking the spy masters of History Unplugged. I'll explain what that is in a second. Our spy masters include Bill Ivey, Moondoggy from Ohio, Tom from Ohio, Ryan Gillen, Rob from Chicago, Nick Brooks. Michael from New York, Carl from Norway, Josh Reddick, Jennifer French Lee, Jay Carrington, McCraze, David Santi, Chris C., and Baron Fraser. If you'd like to support the show, there's some very easy ways to do so. First, go to the site halfpricehistory.com. I've worked out an arrangement with a lot of the authors who've appeared on this show, and you can go there and get their books for 50% off. All you have to do is go to halfpricehistory.com and enter the promo code UNPLUGGED at checkout. Second, please leave a review and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player of choice, whether Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or whatever. Third, join our Facebook group. You can go to Facebook and search for History Unplugged. There, you can talk with other fans of the show about recent episodes, what you liked, what you didn't like. Also, I have exclusive content there, such as live streams, where I do live versions of podcast episodes where you can leave feedback as I'm talking and I will address it on air. Last, and I think this is the best, is to join our membership program, the Knowlton's Rangers. The Knowlton's Rangers were George Washington's spies during the Revolutionary War, but it's also the name of the membership program for History Unplugged. 
If you go to patreon.com slash unplugged, you can join the membership program at three levels. If you join at the Scout level, you'll get all 400 episodes of History Unplugged absolutely ad-free and early access to new episodes. If you join at the second level, the Intelligence Officer level, you get all the stuff that Scouts get, along with bonus episodes. There's currently about 40 of them, including series on Audie Murphy and Operation Long Jump about the Nazi attempt to assassinate FDR Churchill. 